I'm the CEO and founder of Diffbot, um, which is a knowledge graph that's built from the entire web. And I'm very happy to be here today at the Knowledge Graph Conference. Um, so um, I hope that um, you'll learn three main things from my talk today. Um, kind of the motivation for um, why we built uh, Diffbot and our approach to building the knowledge graph, our knowledge graph. Um, how it works, uh, as much as possible, I'm going to describe um, the core technologies that we've brought together to implement a web scale knowledge graph and some of the applications. So our knowledge graph is fully in production. We have you know, over 400 customers um, that use our knowledge graph. Um, so I come to knowledge graphs from the background of machine learning um, research. Uh, I was a grad student you know, at Stanford. Um, and uh, around that time you know, in our lab, um, they built this data set called ImageNet. Um, and I just wanted to establish kind of you know, hopefully, which is an obvious premise, but um, really, knowledge is what makes artificial intelligence intelligent, right? It's not actually um, neural networks or deep learning or, um, or GPUs, you know, and certainly not TensorFlow. Um, all those, AI existed long before we had uh, any of those things. Long before we had neural networks, we had other models, right, like random forests, like linear regression. Um, long before we had GPUs, we had CPUs and Lisp machines and mainframes. Um, but knowledge is really what, um, you know, whether you're talking about supervised machine learning where you're actually providing semantic labels or you're talking about unsupervised machine learning where you're trying to induce semantic labels, knowledge is really what connects um, these learning systems to um, human beings. And that's why, uh, you know, it's, it's the key ingredient to making intelligent systems. So when this um, ImageNet data set came out, um, you know, this was basically around 1.2 million training images into about 1,000 different ontological categories. And they used, um, you can't see the slides, but they used basically the hierarchy of, of WordNet, you know, sin sets. And, and the, these are all these different variety of funguses that fall within that, you know, level of tree. Um, they basically used crowdsourced labor, Amazon Mechanical Turk, right? I think they were, um, in 2012, basically the largest customer of Amazon Mechanical Turk was this ImageNet labeling. And the labelers labeled about 50 images per minute. And as you can see, the um, production of this, this data resource essentially is what led to um, the recent you know, improvements in the computer vision task, you know, going from you know, basically a little bit better than a coin flip to now better than human level accuracy right, in an object recognition. Um, so I was working in the lab around this time, and I was thinking about um, another problem, which was you know, how do we um, build a similar kind of thing but to understand language. So, um, you know, um, I think language is what defines us as human beings. You know, like my dog has computer vision, can tell the difference between like a bone and a ball and, you know, like a treat, and, but he doesn't have, you know, like anything approximating human language. Um, the problem with trying to engineer a system like this, uh, using in this approach for language, is you run into some, some challenges, right? So if you think about, first of all, in language, how many concepts are there, right? The equivalent of these image classes. Well, if you just think about, okay, Wikipedia, you know, um, has approximately uh, single order um, millions to 10 million articles in it, and it's kind of trailing off now. Um, and with state-of-the-art relation extraction, typically, um, as an earlier speaker mentioned, you need a lot of examples for, e for each relation, um, about a thousand label examples for each of those concepts. Uh, you need 10 to the order nine labels, right? And the best annotator can label language maybe with 10 seconds, like per label. That equates to basically 316.8 man years uh, at the cost of mechanical trick that's about $50 million, right? And this is only for the head concepts, right? So things that meet the notability requirement you know, of, of Wikipedia, which is, I would argue, like less than 1% of the concepts you really do need to, to understand language. So um, I wanted to make the point that you know, just having a static set of these head entities isn't really sufficient to understanding language. Um, real world applications, these business applications, um, useful applications, they need knowledge that's specific. So not just these head entities, they need the long tail. And they need the ability to acquire the knowledge on demand. Right? You can't just hard code a, set, a knowledge base into a robot or any kind of intelligent system and have it just go off into the world with that pre-canned set of knowledge. It needs to be able to automatically discover new knowledge on the fly. Right? So a closed set of head entities, you know, it's, if you think about how many, um, you know, not to rag on Wikidata, we love Wikidata, but uh, if you think about how many like, actual useful applications there are of these general knowledge graphs, 
Um, it basically, it's trivia, like Watson QA. It's consumer search, right? Like if you're, if you're Google, um, you can optimize for head queries, you know, like Taylor Swift. You can put those most popular things, you know, and make a knowledge panel for it. But once you get into the business world and useful applications, you need the tail entities, you know, applications like business intelligence, sales, uh, bookkeeping, customer service, e-commerce, um, supply chain management, procurement, accounting. So in these things, um, I like to say, you know, you're not trying to sell things to like Tiger Woods. You're not trying to like recruit Barack Obama. Um, these day-to-day -day vendors, suppliers, associates, friends, and colleagues, uh, they're not in any of these um, kind of like, you know, web scale head entity knowledge graphs. So um, basically, uh, you know, these labels are expensive to acquire and that's why we don't have, you know, kind of human level uh, intelligent systems yet. Um, you can, this is kind of what the overall trend looks like. You know, we have expert systems where basically people, a uh, speaker earlier was talking about rules, you know, would create, you know, thousands to even tens of thousands of rules if you really focus um, you know, like Sitecorp is an example of something like that where a particular organization can build actually a pretty large rule set of uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe single digit millions. Um, you have crowdsourced knowledge acquisition, so things like Wikipedia, Wikidata, um, where you can get up to 10, 1 million to 10 million entities, um, generally viewing the, um, the head entities or the, the most important in a company like the, the C level and VP level, but not all the lower level employees. Um, that was really enabled by crowdsourcing and using like volunteer labor pools around around the web, and you know, and of course, you know, there's a new, a new thing that's coming up, which I'll talk to you about in the last slide. But basically, there's there's basically four orders of magnitude increase in KG size with each of these um, defining technologies, and there's an inverse relationship to the cost of attaining, you know, each fact with, with each of these new technologies, right? And of course, the thing I'm here to talk about is I think artificial intelligence is really the right strategy if we want to really want to get a comprehensive knowledge graph of all the entities. Um, and that's the approach that uh, we take at DiffBot. So um, I'm going to talk about um, how we do this at DiffBot. So we um, are, are an AI research company that was spun out from Stanford University when I, where I was originally a grad student. Um, and we bring together really lots of different disciplines. Um, we crawl the full web, so we're one of the few US entities that does a full web crawl. Uh, the other two are Google and Bing. Um, and what we um, do with each page is a little bit different. So uh, the, the reason we're able to crawl the full web is because our VP of search is, was the previous founder of a search engine. So he, he basically wrote like two million lines of C++ code that handled all the edge cases, and, and he joined right away. And so we were able to crawl the web from two data centers in the Bay Area. Um, when we encounter each page on the web, we render the page fully in a, in a full virtual web browser. So we basically made a, a fork of the Chromium uh, uh, rendering engine, which is the rendering engine that powers Safari and Chrome, and we adapted it for machine learning. So it dumps out from that rendering process all of the visual information of the page. For every X, Y position on the page, we have its RGB alpha value. We have the internal state of the, the, um, the DOM, the, the JavaScript virtual machine, the CSS, the painting. We have all the transaction data that happens in HTTP conversations, uh, the time of flight info, the headers, and so forth. And, uh, and we stripped away a whole bunch of stuff to make it render, you know, like 100 times faster than Chrome uh, at billions of pages per, per month uh, in, in, our, in our data center. And then we dump out all of this um, deep low-level features that then we use in our machine learning pipeline. So in our pipeline, uh, I'll just run through it real quick what we do. So the first stage, what we do is we take all that deep information from the render and we classify the page. So we found basically that the, the web um, can be at top level classified into about 20 different page types that can cover about 98% of the surface of the web. So these include article pages, navigational pages, people pages, organizational pages, uh, product pages, image pages, discussion threads, FAQs. Um, there's about 20 or so of these top level types and we have a, we use supervised learning to classify it into one of these. And then depending on the type, then we ex extract it as an entity. So if it's a person, we're going to extract that person's uh, employment and their name and their image and their gender and you know, where they attended school and all these things. If it's a product, uh, we'll be able to extract like the price, the SKU, the brand, the color, and so forth. Once we've decomposed um, the structure of the document, then uh, we have certain farms that will handle natural language processing. So we're able to analyze all the different languages that are on the web uh, and do. Oh, I'll have a slide that shows um, that uh, relation extraction. Then we um, parcel out and analyze the images that are on the page. So we're able to do computer vision on the images and on the video frames, uh, for example, to determine any facts that are inside um, the media. And then we're, and then we're able to, uh, once we have all these extractions, then fuse them together 
um, basically determine, okay, is this John Smith that's from this one page the same as the, uh, John Smith on this other page? Is this iPhone you know, 4, you know, 4S on this one page the same as that iPhone 4S on the other page? Um, using um, what we call record linking. It's a machine learning problem. We're able to uh, join those together, and then the knowledge fusion produces the probability of truth of each of those facts and retains the provenance information from, of the original page that that fact came from. So we have every fact that's in the final knowledge graph has a probability score about how confident we are this is accurate and timely and recent, and the original primary sources that fact came from and, and which extractors were used to obtain that fact. Um, so the Current knowledge graph has about 10 billion entities, about a trillion facts in it. Those are um, sort of the top level uh, types, and then the lo lower level types of the schema are automatically uh, found using techniques like open relation extraction and, and you know, um, finding you know like um, sub uh, subject predicate pairs. Um, we applied this to basically every page on the public web, which is about 50 to now 70 billion documents. Uh, our crawl of the web uh, and in our sampling is as comprehensive as Google's, and it's even deeper in certain sites than Google's crawl because we use technologies like rendering and distributed dynamic proxies and, and, and things like that to, um, to crawl really deeply into the site. We're actually just like kind of interacting with the web like a video game. And on many pages, you have to um, click on various things, close various banners, uh, paginate through 10 pages of an article to concatenate it together into a single article entity. Um, and our system is autonomously acquiring about 150 million entities per month. Um, and um, once um, yeah, we do that extraction, you know, I mentioned we uh, link and fuse the facts together, uh, and then we estimate the probability of truth. This is a visualization of the, um, the entity linking and clustering thing for George W. Bush, uh, an entity. Um, I won't go over the applications, because a lot of people have already spent a lot of time talking about those. But essentially, inside the enterprise, you know, um, databases are, you know, uh, knowledge worker management systems. Like each of these different business functions essentially has their own silo of data that can be enriched with information from the diffbot knowledge graph, right? So sales, uh, recruiting, HR, business intelligence, marketing, supply chain, um, there's more detailed talks that talk about those applications. Um, we're able to, um, this is one interesting application, which is analyzing text. So this is the output of DiffBot's relation extraction system. It's able to read, like, for example, a bio on the web. This is the bio of Marissa Mayer you know, from her uh, Yahoo Corp bio page. And it's able to find those entities in our knowledge graph and the relation between those two entities and map that relation to an ont ontological relation in our knowledge graph. Um, we're able to entity link to um, you know, a much larger knowledge graph than what's described in academia, generally links to like, you know, uh, Wikidata or Freebase. Uh, we're able to link to the DiffBot knowledge graph, right, which has 10 billion entities. So it's able to link even these really small tail uh, things like the meetup group or like the, uh, the, the local, you know, like Taco Bell can be linked into there. Um, so um, basically, this is what I think summarized the impact of this kind of technology. It's going to um, uh, these kind of automated knowledge based construction techniques means that people are going to spend less time actually gathering data, right? So, you know, a joke about, uh, you know, data analysts is they actually spend most of the time data gathering and not actually analyzing. Um, and it's going to, you know, empower massive gains in productivity. Um, and lastly, I want to mention that we partner with a lot of academic research groups as well. So um, we actually provide access to our knowledge graph. It's something you can use, and you can use it to do research. So our goal for doing this is we want to really accelerate uh, advancement in the state of the art in information extraction and knowledge acquisition. We want to enable that researcher to productively stay in academia. It's very difficult right now for those kind of folks to actually do large scale uh, KG integration research in academia and they feel like they have to go to industry. We feel like they should be able to stay there. Um, what we provide is access to the default knowledge graph, uh, access to our data centers, uh, hardware uh, advice. So we, you know, we have like 400 customers so we can um, kind of direct um, um, PIs into like what areas of research are fruitful and not kind of duplicative with, with what other people are researching. We can provide talent um, collaboration with our scientists. And we can also provide financial support and grants for, for good projects that wouldn't have otherwise gotten funded. And so you can contact me directly, Mike at defbutt.com, if you would like to submit something. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. We actually have time for oh, a couple okay. of questions. Um, <clears throat> this is great. I, um, I will start. Uh, maybe a first question. You, you mentioned you're also uh, extracting information from videos uh, mm -hmm. uh, using deep learning, I yeah. assume. Uh, that is very 
uh, expensive, yeah. right? Uh, so can you tell a little yeah. more about how, uh, how deep you go in your learning? It's pretty surface level right now for videos. We'll extract the metadata about the video, such as uh, um, the category, the duration, the transcript, um, the entities mentioned in it from analyzing the transcript. Um, we have kind of government customers that to go a little bit more advanced in, into video. Um, we're able to crawl, like I said, because we crawl the full web, we're even able to get into certain areas of the world where the web uh, is really messy <laughs> and, um, you know, it's hard to get to. We encounter all kinds of, you know, interesting things <laughs> doing that. Uh, yeah, talking about that, so, so how, how do you deal with uh, data quality mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, duplicates in your entities and, and all the, oh, yeah. that fun? So, yeah, I mean, our, uh, our goal for this year as a company is to um, become the most accurate knowledge graph. Um, because not just, I think, it's already very large. Um, but accuracy is a big focus, so data quality, right? Each, each customer that we deal with has their, they don't care about the overall quality of the knowledge graph. They care about the quality of their particular universe of entities that they're trying to enrich, right? They'll give us, like, here's our entire customer database. Can you find these entities in the knowledge graph? And so we work with them, and then we, we measure data quality. Internally, all of the different KPIs of all of our machine learning components are measured, uh, and then the overall quality of the knowledge graph has autom automated battery of tests that hit it. And um, we have a lot of work in knowledge fusion, you know, so um, we have folks now that have recently joined, have an expertise in that area that are using um, probabilistic techniques in order to, to estimate um, very good um, senses of the accuracy. Another co key component about the accuracy is also the recency as well. So we keep the track of the timestamp of when we crawl that fact so we can factor in, that in to, for, for example, produce like a time, time series of like something that changes over time, like someone's employment or location, right? Very cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Very impressive. Just quick question on uh, representation. What language do you use to represent data in the graph? Uh, it's, we, we, use, we use JSON to store the data. Uh, great talk. Can you talk more about the um, uh, record fusion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the rec uh, the, what we call rec um, record, we call actually record linking. Uh, that problem is basically given two entities, are they the same entity, right? So we might have extracted using our techniques um, from two different pages on the web. And um, there's, for example, like 50,000 John Smiths in our knowledge graph, right? And we have a, a process in our pipeline. The entire knowledge graph takes about 2.5 days to build on several thousand CPU cores. And, you know, we're trying to reduce that. Um, there's a certain segment of that uh, pipeline that takes uh, about seven hours to, to, to run on uh, several thousand CPU core. And that, that, what that segment does is basically it compares those extracted um, you know, records from different, um, different extractions, and then it does a pairwise comparison. Obviously, you can't compare, you know, uh, several hundred billion uh, records to each other, so we have to use techniques like blocking and hashing to compare um, reasonable amounts. Um, but then uh, it does that basically quadratic comparison, and then it, it clusters them all together, and then, then you have a cluster, basically, of extractions, and Knowledge Fusion takes in as an input that cluster of extractions, and then estimates, okay, which one of these were, um, like if it, if, it, if it says this fact on multiple places, you know, it might be more likely to be true. Um, different places on the web might have different aspects of a person or, or a, a place or a product, right? Like your professional CV will have something different than your Instagram account, than your um, like social network. So, um, but then, you know, if one of them says that, you know, like you live in Europe, and then it says though that, you know, your main employer is like in the Bay Area, then um, it might assign a, a lower weight for both of those occurring, right? Um, and so it uses um, ontological reasoning in order to um, discard like certain things like that. Um, and then recency is really important too because um, you know the web is always changing, so we, we can discover new facts and new entities and try to get them in as, as soon as possible. 